Welcome to the ISF podcast from the Information Security Forum, featuring timely conversations, practical insights, and resources for global cybersecurity professionals. I'm your host, Tavia Gilbert. Today, CEO Steve Durbin speaks with Professor Federico Varese, a professor of criminology and head of the sociology department at Nuffield College at Oxford University. Professor Varese talks with Steve about the history of organized crime in Russia and around the world, the mafia's movement into cybercrime, and what the future may hold for these criminal organizations. Federico, thank you very much for joining me on this podcast. You are the head of the sociology department and a professor of criminology at Nuffield College in Oxford, where your main area of research, as I understand it, is the study of organized crime. We've covered on this podcast series, Organized Crime, over the past years. We've spoken to people like Brett Johnson, who was on the um, FBI's most wanted list from a cybercrime perspective. And just the other day, we're talking to Alexander Zager, who's the head of the cybercrime unit, who you probably know. So lots of different perspectives that we've had in terms of what's going on. But you've specialized, if I put it that way, in organized crime in that particular space. Tell our listeners, first of all, how you got into that. How did you become interested in that whole area? Yes, and thank you so much for having me on your program. So I was a student in the late 80s, early 90s. I was just finishing my undergraduate degrees. And that was the moment when the Soviet Union was coming to an end. It was the transition to the market economy and the emergence of a new country. So that caught my attention and that really caught my passion as I was a student. And I really wanted to study that major transformation. I thought it was my only chance in life to see a country of that dimension transform its economic system into something new. Now, that transformation uh, was not going that well. (laughs) And (laughs) one of the features of that uh, transformation that were not going very well was the fact that the state was not able to define and protect property rights. There was massive amount of violence on the streets over who owned what, and crime was rising massively as a consequence of the transition. So to cut the long story short, I got really fascinated by the connection between the end of the Soviet planned economy, the emergence of the market economy, and the emergence of organized crime in Russia. And this is what I wrote my PhD thesis on. So I wrote a book, eventually became a book published in 2001 called The Russian Mafia. So I start off really as an economic sociologist interested in the market economy, interested in how markets operate and how elements who are not legal but are extra legal or illegal actually come to govern those markets. And so I spent in the 90s, most of my time in Russia, I spent one year doing field work in the city of Perm. And then I went back to that place many times. And the culmination of that work is is my first book. So this is the answer to your first question, you know, where I come from. Uh, And from then on, I specialized in various aspects of organized crime, which we can talk about in a second. And how has organized crime matured over that period that you've been watching it, you've been studying it? You mean in Russia or in general? Yeah, Um, both actually because you started off looking at specifically at the Russian space. So I think it'd be interesting to understand how it's matured there, but also then what impact that has had much more globally. Yes. So I mean, what surprised me is that there was a lot of similarities between the organized crime that was emerging in Russia with uh, the traditional organized crime that I knew from Italy and from studying the United States, uh, Japan and Hong Kong. So the attempt of organized crime in Russia in the 90s was very much to control territories and markets, to be an arbiter, an authority, and so to become an alternative, in effect, to the state. Uh, That was really the moment of the 90s when there was a lot of war between gangs. And what was fascinating about Russian organized crime at the time, and it's still true today, um, there was a fraternity, a secret fraternity of bosses called the Vorek Zakonia, which I studied a great deal, which had ritual norms of behavior, they interacted regularly, and they tried to settle conflict among each other over the Soviet space and the post-Soviet space. 
So that also I found is very interesting because it was very similar to what you have in the Sicilian case, for instance. You have bosses that meet in the commission. You have the same in, in the US, in Japan, in Hong Kong. Now, Russia is a special story because after the roaring 90s, if you want, or the wild east of the 90s, the Russian state has taken more control over the markets and over the, the crime of the, of the country. And the mafias are now mostly operating from jail. So they have less of a scope to operate. So they operate mainly in illegal markets like prostitution and drugs. And also they control the prisons to a great extent. And so there have been a lot of recent scandals over violence in prison, both from authorities and from the criminals. So in a sense, the evolution of organized crime in Russia since the time I studied it in, for my PhD to today is the sort of coming back of the strong state, which has squeezed to some extent uh, the traditional mafia that emerged in the 90s. Mm-hmm. And organized crime, certainly when, when I talk to people at you know Interpol, Europol, they talk about the way in which organized crime has moved from perhaps some of the more traditional lines of business, if I could put it that way, that you've just described, very much more into cyber, into taking advantage of some of the ways in which cyber has been evolving. Tell us a little about that. What are the sorts of things that you've seen? Yes, no, I don't want to sound like a boring academic, as you said before, I'm a professor <laughs> and a head of a department now. Uh, but I suppose we now need to really understand what we mean by organized crime, because right. there are at least uh, three kind of, of activities, or three kind of types of organized crime. There is what I would call a mafia, a traditional organized crime group that controls and governs a territory. Then there are people who are not a mafia, who are either in the business of producing illegal goods like drugs or prostitution, or buying the goods and trading them in some form and moving the good from A to B. Now, in my view, a lot of what is called cybercrime actually occurs in the sphere of trading. So certainly with the development of the internet, a lot of stealing uh, and selling illegal goods happens online. And so we have seen, and this is something you have covered a lot in your podcast, you have, we've seen the booming of fora or forum online, where you can just go on and buy and sell goods. And that has been evolving a great deal. Now, the guys I traditionally study are um, localized in a territory. So certainly, I wouldn't say that the guys that I study have moved online. They're still very much offline, and they still very much control the territory. But a lot of the people who are in the business of criminality have, as you said, moved online. And there are interesting developments. I also study cybercrime to some extent. Originally, people would uh, go on forum and buy and sell in a very narrative way. Now the sites are much more structured. They look very much like an Amazon type setup. You know, there's a famous one called Rampedusa. You just point and click and buy what you want. So it's been very, there is automation, automatication of the, the process. But I suppose my personal take on, on what is um, cyber and what is uh, the development of cyber is that most people forget one aspect, that even though you might be online and you might be uh, sort of in a global sphere, which is up there, you still are a criminal that lives in a place. So there is an offline dimension to the online dimension of cyber. And that's something I've been trying to uh, think about as an important dimension. And, and we can speak about it further, you don't see cybercrime being normally distributed around the world. There are hubs, there are countries where you have a higher number of attacks to sites than others. And so there is a geographical offline dimension to cybercrime, which in a sense vindicates sort of the work I've done on the traditional mafias, because usually this off-site offline sites are where mafias are very strong or where criminal states also operate. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, because you mentioned this sort of offline hubs, that kind of thing, are these particularly well connected in your experience? So so do we have a situation where people are understanding where to go to get the support, if you like, that they might need? I'm talking about criminal gangs now, these different hubs. How collaborative are they? How cooperative are they? 
So certainly the gangs collaborate online. So the individual criminal firm, in a sense, collaborates on rights as you would expect. But the hubs are um, discrete. So I studied in particular one hub in Romania called Ramniku Vulcha, which is known as Hackerville. So I went there, I spent a week. And that is a very tiny place in, in the mountains in Romania. And when you dig further, you find that in that hub, there is a concentration of Romanian cyber criminals who are somehow protected by the local police or the local mafia or corrupt police officers in the local mafia. Then you find hubs of cyber criminality, of course, in Russia today, uh, where there is a lot of this going on. And again, it's because the policing of that domain is not done very effectively. There are hubs in Vietnam, there are hubs in Brazil. And so part of my work now is trying to quantify better these hubs and then to start to, to try to understand why some hubs become so and some don't. But I wouldn't say there is a strong collaboration between these hubs themselves. I think they just become a catalyst or a focal point for this kind of activity to take place. And I think we should really get out of the idea that uh, cyber crimes occurs only online. I think right. cyber crimes occurs offline by individual people, people like you and I, who mm -hmm. have uh, a life, a computer, and they go out and shop and, and do stuff. And so all of that dimension of their life has to be taken into account when we study their activities. And there are some places which make it easier for them to operate physical places, geographical spots, as opposed, and then of course there is the online dimension of it, which is well known. Right. Okay. Now there may be some people listening to this thinking, well, you know, Federico has been able to spend time investigating these gangs, really understands how they work, has explained to us what's going on. Why is it that law enforcement isn't able to crack down on them and effectively close them down? If you know, this is the problem that we're led to believe that it is of the size that it is. Why is law enforcement so powerless, some might be thinking? To crack down on the hubs? Well, yeah. uh, because these hubs are in territories where effective law enforcement is not existent or not very effective. So we know, for instance, that law enforcement in the US and in the UK against cyber is pretty effective. The FBI has been mounting very effective operations against uh, forum or, or websites on the dark web and leading them to shut down. There was a case in which even an FBI undercover agent be, became the manager of the site and then it was shut down. Uh, mm -hmm. So they were very good at infiltrating them. And of course, once they are shut down, they simply reopen somewhere else, which right. also begs the question, what should we do with those things online? But then to go back to your question, namely, why law enforcement doesn't crack down on the hubs? Well, because the local law enforcement doesn't want to. So it, it would be easy, but they don't want to uh, because either they are ineffective or inefficient or ultimately they think it's okay for them to operate. So as you probably know, a lot of Russian cyber crime is uh, directed against uh, targets that are not in Russia. And so there is a view that ultimately that doesn't really affect Russia really so much or this kind of reasoning might happen in other places. And so they are left operating and, and outside the law enforcement obviously cannot uh, interfere in a different country. So it's the same reason why we still see organized crime flourishing in parts of the world, say in Southern Italy or in uh, parts of Latin America, in parts of Eastern Europe, uh, because there is a limitation to the ability of law enforcement to crack down on these hubs. So what then do you think is the answer if this criminality is a real problem for us? And as you've explained, perhaps local law enforcement are not incentivized to take the action that some people might assume they would. Mm. What is the solution? Where do we go from here? Well, that's a great question, and, uh, and uh, I will answer it. I will not shy away from answering the question. So uh, certainly one solution, or at least one way of doing it, which is, is pursued, is obviously international cooperation as much as possible. We shouldn't uh, uh, let, let's say, a country like uh, Romania deal with cybercrime on its own. I think there should be international cooperation and help. So certainly that, that's an easy answer in a sense, but it's certainly true that uh, we shouldn't think that uh, the problem of organized crime of this kind is a national problem. And so we just stop at trying to cooperate. Now, of course, there is a degree to which uh, this uh, 
countries might not even want to cooperate. And there is just a limit to that. And so I think there are obviously technical solutions in the case of cybercrime, which obviously I'm not an expert on, but we all know how we can protect ourselves anyway from um, cyber attacks uh, to some extent. But obviously there is a degree to which people just want to go on this site and buy legal goods. And so then you have to ask yourself, what do we do with these online sites like the Amazon of the dark web or the, or the forum of the dark web? What do we do? So one approach has been to shut them down, as you know, right? Silk Road, you know, it was shut down. And what happens right. after that? Three Silk Roads pop up. <laughs> so we're not going very far. We fragment the market, we possibly make it even bigger. So then the question is, is it appropriate to just shut them down or maybe better to monitor them and to control them as much as possible? So work I've been doing recently with colleagues at Oxford and Cambridge University has been to set up some way to, to think about in an empirical way, how to disrupt this fora by injecting doses of mistrust or distrust. Uh, so by creating, for instance, uh, Sibyl attacks. So you mm -hmm. create a fake seller who sells substandard goods, or you create fake uh, customers who give uh, false reports on the quality of the goods that they bought. And so in a sense, uh, what you can do is to introduce uh, elements that make the market work less well than it does now. And so this is a more fine grain, more subtle way to disrupt the online trading that takes place uh, Currently, I'm not saying it's the only, it's the final solution, but it may be a smart solution that should be pursued. Mm -hmm. And just w when I was talking to Alexander Sager the other day, he was explaining that there's very much more cooperation across states. He talked about the uh, Bucharest Treaty and, and some of the advances that have been made in that space. Some of our listeners may well have, have listened to his podcast, which I think was out just last week. And certainly his view was that, you know, if we can increase that level of cooperation across borders, then that is one way in which we can share some of the information that you've been just talking about to really try to, I suppose, not control, but to get a bit of visibility, make it a little bit more difficult, more challenging for criminal gangs, and effectively to, I suppose, increase the cost of doing business, because that obviously is something that they are concerned about as well. In your experience, how profitable, just to give people some sort of idea of the size of the problem we're talking about, how profitable is this particular space from an organized crime standpoint? So on the point of cooperation, I totally agree. I think uh, that that's, a, which is also something I just said. And so it's a very good idea. Now, of course, there is a limit to cooperation. We, we are living yep. these days a uh, geopolitical crisis uh, with uh, the Ukrainian and Russian attack. So obviously there will be a limit to which some states want to cooperate with others for geopolitical reasons. So cooperation yes. is very good. And I think we should pursue it. And maybe it can go a long way, even bypassing some of the geopolitical difficulties. But there is certainly always a problem. I, obviously, cooperation over extradition. For instance, uh, there is in Europe, uh, Eurojust, uh, that is a very useful entity. So this, I don't want to get too technical, but there is this sort of legal body which coordinates investigations over organized crime within the European Union. And so if you have a... A transnational investigation that involves more than one country, of course, instead of having each prosecutor work on his own, there is this body where all the prosecutors meet and coordinate the investigation. It's called Eurojust. The European okay. arrest warrant, again, extremely helpful, both for cyber criminals and non-cyber criminals, organized criminals. The European arrest warrant, which means that it's much easier to move to arrest and extradite a person than normally done in the past before it was introduced. Of course, by withdrawing from the European Union, the United Kingdom has left these bodies, although they may still be invited to Eurojust. So cooperation is certainly good, and I think it's done a lot and it's not been spoken of very much. Now, on your second question, how big is the business? Well, it's very hard to, to estimate, so I wouldn't want to give a number, but I remember trying to quantify myself, although it's not my field of expertise to quantify the size of the cyber crime. But I was um, reading that in just in Russia, there are more than 80 larger sites with uh, hundreds or thousands of advertisements of, of players, i.e. Of, uh, of sellers. 
on each day. So it's a massive, it's a massive market. So imagine 80 sites operating fully at full speed in which people can just buy and sell anything they want. So that's one way to calculate or at least to give a sense of the size of the market. But I wouldn't want to give an, a number on the offshore dollar uh, mm. of the market. I think other people have done that better than I would be able to do. Yeah. And one of the things I suppose that people must be thinking as they're listening to you, Federico, is how have you kept yourself safe? Yes, I mean, you've been investigating all these organized crime gangs now for quite some while. How do you manage to, to stay on the right side of them, if I could put it that way? Well, it's a very good question, and I'm often asked that by my family, <laughs> who is actually quite worried at the time, a family and friends. So in some sense, uh, when I was doing my field work, uh, I was trying to ask these people who I encountered to a great extent what they felt. So I wanted, I didn't want to ask them a specific instance of what they did and who did what to whom, but just how they felt, how they see themselves, what do they see themselves in the mirror when they wake up in the morning, what they think their life is about, uh, what kind of norms, what kind of uh, ideology they believe in. So, and also I've always made clear that I'm a scholar, I'm not a police officer, I don't... Uh, double I as an investigator or as a or as a spy so my is purely an academic interest just to understand and in a sense by being open and sort of putting myself out there uh, I think that has somehow protected me in some way there is a tendency for people like me also to exaggerate the risk that they run mm-hmm. so I certainly don't want to run the picture of myself as a sort of a the anthropologist as a hero in the field who goes into the field and risks his life I think there are Procedures, you know, as, as you said, I'm a professor and a head of department, so we follow very strict ethical procedures. It's a field which is thriving. It's a field that I encourage people to approach through the use of ethnography in field interviews. I very much believe that in order to understand this world, you have to go out there and have a look and take a look. It's not the only way. Also, data are important. But uh, you need to understand the physical space people inhabit. You need to understand the local condition. So there was a writer that I like very much called John Le Carré, who said the biggest crime is uh, to observe the world from a desk, <laughs> the biggest mm-hmm. intellectual crime. So I certainly encourage um, my students to go to places and, of course, to keep safe and follow the procedures. So I don't think it's impossible. I think it's... Uh, it's possible to do this without uh, risking your life, but watch this space. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hope you do manage to continue to stay safe in, in the work that you're doing. Federico, it's been fascinating talking to you. Thank you so much for actually lifting the lid a little bit on organised crime, on some of the things that you've been seeing, and adding, I think, a, a very different perspective, I would say, to some of the things we normally talk about on this podcast when we get into the whole area of cybercrime. So some of the things you mentioned about the offline component and so on, I think it's very interesting for for people to just take into account. So it's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much indeed for taking the time. And I look forward to uh, being able to read more of your research about the work that you're undertaking. So thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure. Listeners, we hope you found this episode informative. I'll remind you to take a look at the show notes, where you'll find links to ISF resources related to today's discussion of organized crime, including past episodes of this podcast where we interview former cyber criminal Brett Johnson, Alexander Sager, head of the Cybercrime Division at the Council of Europe, and Misha Glenny, author of Mick Mafia. Thanks very much to this week's guest, Professor Federico Varese. Next week, Steve and I wrap up Season 10 with a discussion of some of his takeaways from our guests this season. We'll be back for the full conversation in a week. In the meantime, is there a topic or question that you'd like us to cover in a future episode? Let us know at securityforum.org, which is also where you can find that catalog of past video and podcast episodes as well as ISF's research, practical tools, and guidance related to discussions like today's. Follow us on LinkedIn by searching CEO Steve Durbin or Security Forum. Follow our audio feed wherever you get your podcasts so you never miss an episode. And if you like the ISF podcast, we'd love it if you'd write us short review and if you'd rate the podcast. The ISF podcast is produced by TalkBox and Tavia Gilbert, with music by Alexander Filipiak, associate producer Katie Flood.
Mix and Master by Brian Barney. Thanks for listening.